So Terry and I are going to talk today both about um, overall leadership qualities um, for our coaches and our administrators and our education directors, um, as well as how to create a culture of support. So I'm going to jump in and get started. So this wheel will look familiar to those of us um, who have spent some time in the, the Delivering on the Promise of Class webinars over the course of this year. Um, as Megan already mentioned, um, we did a series of, of webinars. Um, I started out the year talking about data-driven PD and really why does it work, really focusing it on this collecting observation data and really using data to identify individual teachers' needs. Um, and then we spent some time really talking about why PD isn't one size fits all. And I'll spend some more time on this today. This idea that we have learned to differentiate education and instruction for kids, but we have not done a great job differentiating PD for teachers. And then we spent um, another hour together really talking about why professional does development doesn't mean reinventing the wheel. This idea that you are already doing so many of the right things, it's just organizing them in a system such as this or such as one that really works for your individual organization. And so one of the things I always like to talk about is the how, right? So we're going to spend some time talking about how do you create a, a culture of support, but I think one of the things we often miss is the why. And just like we want to teach children how to answer and to think about how or order questions, it's important for us to think about those how or order questions as well. And the why, thinking about why is it important really to think about why we need to develop the sense of community. And what are we missing if we're just um, thinking about the steps that we take, but not really analyzing it. So we can't unfortunately have a discussion. I'd love to sit across the table from each one of you today. Um, so instead of a discussion question, I thought I would think I thought about them as a reflection point. So I just want you to take a minute if you have a piece of paper uh, or an old PowerPoint that you're working on to jot down um, and think about these three questions as I begin. First, how are you already thinking about building a culture of support within your organization? Even if it's not something that you are actively doing, I know that over coffee in the morning, over your drive on I-95, um, or over conversation with kind of your trusted colleagues, these are, these are things that you are already thinking about. Um, and then I want you to think about what you're doing that you would like to build on. Just like I'll talk about children already always have this one little strength that we can touch on and grow, so are things that are happening in your organization kind of flowers that are blossoming that you can help nurture. And then the other thing I think it's very important to do are what think about what barriers might you encounter. We all hope that everything works the way we want it to be, but we all know we live in the real world. So it's important to think about what barriers, or sometimes people think about those risks. So take a minute and think about these questions to yourself, jot yourself a note, um, and then I will go on with the next slide. So for those of you who have joined me at conference presentations before, you know that I love to think about quotes. Um, and so feel free to use these quotes as you're having meetings with your teams in the future. This is one of my favorites um, from Fred Rogers, and there'll be a second quote from him a little later. So as human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is. That each of us has something that no one else has or ever will have. Something inside that is unique to all time. It is our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. And so as I talk with you today and we talk about those leadership qualities and what you are doing to support those individual trusted relationships um, with the people you're working it with, whether you're a coach or a teacher. I want you to think and reflect on this quote. So unfortunately, I can't share a cake with you, um, but I wanted to talk about um, this slide. So one of the things we think about, I'm a mom, I have two kids, a, a daughter, Samantha, who's nine, who loves to bake, and a, a son, Thomas, who's 12, who also loves to cook. 
And so, as you know, with kids, right, we all love to have them help us in the kitchen, help us start baking, um, but their food sometimes doesn't taste the best and sometimes also doesn't look the best. But as a supportive mom who wants her children to really participate and help me out, the last thing I would ever do is say something like, thank you so much, there's too much frosting on your cake, and let me give you some more tips for not baking it the way you did, right? We wouldn't start in a deficit model for our kids, and we really shouldn't start with a deficit model for our teachers. The better way to go about that is to, to, to talk about, wow, I really like how your cake tasted. For the first time you did it, that was great. Next time I can help you with the frosting a little bit because I know it's a tough thing to do. And when we make those slight changes, we really move from this idea of a deficit model of teacher reaction to a strength-based model. And going between these two things doesn't mean we're not giving honest feedback, but it's just about the way you give that feedback and the way that relationship takes place. Because we all know, if I said to Megan right now, Megan, you know, if, if only you had done X when we started that webinar, right? Her face would fall, her body posture would change. But if I said, I love the introduction you gave me, let's talk about how we can do more of that and expand your role in that webinar in the future. Her face would brighten, she would think about all those ideas she really wanted to try. That's definitely true. <laughs> I'm like smiling thinking she, about she's that. She's smiling at me <laughs> thinking about it. And so, and then just seeing those, these two body parts, right? If you do a deficit model, people are really demotivated. But if you begin with a strength-based model of support, if you really are a leader who believes in the people you work with and builds that trusted relationship, you have people who are happier and who are really motivated to change. And so I, I pulled this slide. So when I present, I often talk about the three top reasons why interactions are important. But this one particularly talks about strength-based interactions. And so when we talk about strength-based interactions and we help teachers in that way, we then define and clarify what they already know about effective teaching. So if I would say to a teacher in a classroom, I love when you are sitting with the three children in the block area and when you opened up the door to their building and asked them those open-ended questions about what they were building and where the children were going and why they needed to go to the emergency room so quickly. That really was a chance for them to give, get good feedback as well as to really think about higher order, higher order thinking. So parallel process. So when we think of, when we work with children in the class, right, we think about things like positive climate and teacher sensitivity and concept development. And so one of the things we started doing with our coaches, or my teaching partner coaches about three years ago, is really having them do this idea of using a parallel process. And what that means is I, as a teacher, am using class with children, and then I, as an administrator, be it a coach, or an education supervisor or a school administrator will then use the class. And so let me give you some examples and then we'll talk through it a little bit more. And so, so thinking about positive climate, so as a teacher, we know it's important, right, that teach the children feel connected in the classroom, that they feel that they can take risks in the classroom. Um, and so a parallel process to that would really be a leader who builds relationships with teachers by engaging in social um, conversations. A leader who, when you, I always talk about this with schools, right, when you walk into a classroom, right, you know you want to be there. And we know that through positive climate, right, and through those indicators. When you walk into a school, right, we don't actually do class observations on school communities, but if you think about it, you really could. And so when you think about the you what you're building as a leader um, and the relationships you're having as a leader, we can use those same those same indicators and those same behavioral markers and what we think about and really judge ourselves and reflect on how we're working. T 
teacher sensitivity works in the same way. I actually pulled out my class manual because I'm a little bit of a class geek um, <laughs> to be able to um, to talk about this a little bit more. So when we think about teacher sensitivity, right, is a is a is I'm observing a classroom. We think about the awareness that the teacher has. Um, is she anticipating problems with children? Is she noticing a lack of understanding? Should we also look for responsiveness? How is she acknowledging emotions? How is she providing comfort or assistance? And how is she providing individualized support? Going down the line, is she addressing problems in a timely manner? Is she helping to resolve problems? And then on the comfort side of students, do students seek support and guidance? Do students freely participate and do students take risks? To me, as a past principal and as a leader of an organization right now, to me, teacher sensitivity is one of the strongest pieces that I could use as a leader to build relationships with my teachers, right? Because there's every piece of teacher sensitivity really speaks to how, as a leader, I acknowledge teachers' emotions about engaging in the work that they do on an everyday basis, particularly in PD, right? As a leader, I need to be aware of the problems that those teachers face and plan how to help them appropriately. I need to be responsive to their needs, providing comfort and assistance when needed, as well as providing individualized re support, right? And our PD um, isn't one size fits all webinar. That's exactly what we talked about, right? We differentiate instruction for kids. We should be in differentiating PD for teachers. And then as a leader, you know, I think about, am I addressing the problem? When I help a teacher, when he comes to me, am I doing that in an effective way? And am I actually resolving the problems, or am I just listening? And then I think the most important piece here is the comfort, right? So student comfort, or I would think about it as teacher comfort. You know, are the teachers coming to me for, for guidance? Are they able to freely participate when we have professional development sessions? And do they take risks? And we're going to speak about that a little bit more. So I encourage you to think about the class, particularly positive climate teacher sensitivity and concept development. But you can think about it with all the dimensions, about how can you create a parallel process within your, within your leadership, within your community. Um, for those of you who have had the pleasure to either work with or go to conference presentations with Deborah Pacciano from the OUNCE, She's doing this work um, with, teacher, with teachers and um, their child care directors um, within, a, within an I3 study as well as within a project called Lead, Lead, Lead Learn Excel. <laughs> so I'm going to pause again for another quote because I think this is important, especially as we just talked about that teacher sensitivity piece. If you could only sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, how important you can be to the people you may never even dream of, there is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. And so just as teachers, we have very powerful jobs, right? Sometimes we don't feel like it, but when you think about what you change, what a teacher changes with a, a single meeting with a child and a family, but that is taken to another level as a leader or as a coach, because what you, how you work with teachers on a daily basis really will change, and you are leaving something of yourself. You're leaving your knowledge, you're leaving your motivation, um, and you're leaving the respect you have for them. So I want to talk just a little bit about this, this kind of complementary area to, to teacher sensitivity um, and about really about building trust um, as a leader. Uh, so we just had a, as I mentioned, I um, had the opportunity to kind of oversee our staff at Teach Stone, um, and we had a director's meeting yesterday um, where we asked them to kind of freely participate. And as I thought about it, it's a little bit of, I was building a community of teacher sensitivity and really building trust. And when we think about building trust as a leader, we think about three primary areas. Honesty, collaboration, and formative feedback. So when we think about honesty, honesty just isn't, you know, am I telling the truth all the time? But it's really taken to a deeper level. So as a leader, am I transparent in what am I doing? Am I sharing everything that I can share with them so that they understand how my decisions are being made? Am I an objective leader? 
Like, do I do I lead with objectivity? Do I understand what's going on? Am I confidential in my work? You, as we, as as leaders, we gather a lot of information that is about families, about children, and about our staff that is confidential. And the best way to have respect from them, staff members, are so that they know if they come to us with a problem as a coach, right, and there's something they're really struggling with, what, that we will hold that in their com in our confidence. And then reliability. Am I always there? Is my door open? If I say I have room on my schedule, will I make time so that I can help them work through a problem? Am I open? in sharing my struggles as well? And then am I respectful? Just like in the class we talk about positive climate and teachers respecting children, a parallel process to that really is leaders respecting teachers. And then the second part about building trusting relationships are really having honest collaboration, right? Not just collaboration for face value, but collaboration that really matters. So as a, a leader, am I allowing time for collaboration and is that happening in a timely basis, right? If, I, if teachers are saying, we need to get together, we need to figure out, we're struggling with this literacy piece, am I helping them get together in a time that really matters and not saying, we'll do that two months down when we have something on our calendar? Am I giving them an opportunity to really review um, evidence before a discussion? And then am I working with them together for an area of focus, right? and that strength base? Am I helping them see where there's a need and then talking them through it? And then am I giving them an opportunity to reflect? One of the things we know through the My Teaching Partner work is that some of the power of change in My Teaching Partner is that built into that relationship is time for that teacher to reflect, right? So if, if I was a My Teaching Partner coach and Megan was my teacher, I wouldn't just say, here's your video and I want you to talk about it and think about it right now, right? I would show her, show her, give her that video ahead of time, give her time to reflect on it and think about it and process it and respond to my prompt and then come back to me. Because that reflection time shows that I honor and I respect her thought and don't want to catch her doing something wrong. I want to catch her doing something right and give her time to really think about it. And then the last piece about this, about this honesty piece, about this teacher sensitivity, is just, as a leader, how am I giving formative feedback? Do I give it and do I ask for it, right? Just we, as leaders, often give feedback to teachers, but do we allow teachers a loop, a 360, which we're seeing in the business world a lot right now, to give feedback to us? Am I, do I have that policy in place, but maybe not encourage it, right? There's a difference, right? You can have a policy on the books, but you might not actually encourage it. So I'm doing that. And then do I have an open door time for people to come to see me as needed? As well as an open door time for, for teachers, where teachers really want to invite me into the conversation and invite me into their classroom um, so that I can see what they're doing on a daily basis. Andrea had a great point. She, she summed it up, I think, really well. Um, she wrote in and said, especially during the honesty piece, it's a lot about walking the talk. It is absolutely about walking the talk, Andrea. Um, it, 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 so as we were having our meeting yesterday, so one of the things I said to the staff is to say, you know, we are, we are asking for open communication and collaboration. And so if you don't feel you can do that, help me understand why. Is it a time piece? Is it, is, is it not, not being listened to? How can, that, how can we help that? Um, and so you, you, sh you talk about it and you actually do it. So I think that's a perfect segue to this reflection point. So I want you to think about how are you already incorporating these characteristics of honesty, collaboration, and formative review within your organization as a leader? And what are some additional strategies you might try? I mean, I encourage you to get out your class manual or get out your dimensions guide and really think about that parallel process piece. Start at positive climate, um, start at teacher sensitivity or concept development as a leader, and, and, but you branch out to other pieces.
And then what barriers might you encounter? We all know that time is a barrier. And so what can we do to really be creative with our time and to really prioritize what matters? It's one of the things that Deborah Pacciano talks about a lot with her child care leaders, that you have a number of things on your plate, right? You are a business leader. You are a human resources leader. But what are the things that you are doing as an instructional leader, and how are you prioritizing them to find a little bit of time? Even if it's only 30 minutes during your day, it's important. So I'm going to close with a quote that really transitions well to the work that um, Terry's going to talk about, really about building that culture. Pedagogical leaders study and guide the teaching and learning process in their program. They keep everyone focused on the remarkable children in their midst. These leaders question, provoke, and support possibilities for children and teachers to engage in relationships and investigations that bring joy and new learning for both of them, right? Parallel process. Pedagogical leaders challenge teachers to see themselves as researchers in the teaching and learning process and challenge our field to go beyond current definitions of quality. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, transition over to Terry Talon. I'm going to, uh, you'll hear te uh, Terry tell me to advance the slides. Um, she's because she's joining us remotely from Chicago today. Terry? I'm on. just figuring out yeah. how to unmute my button. So um, I'm really thrilled to be able to be joining Rebecca and all of you in the uh, webinar today to think about these really important issues. And I want to talk about the leader's role specifically. And oftentimes we use this term leader and we use it very broadly. Um, as uh, could be many people are leaders within the organization and it's one of the goals of leadership is that it be distributed um, and represented throughout the organization. But I also want to say that um, the, the administrator of the program has a particularly important um, distinct role and if you could change the slide. Um, you all see um, this, uh, this image, which at the McCormick Center, we use this a lot to make the point that um, while we believe leadership at its best is really distributed throughout the organization, it really comes from the early childhood administrator um, setting the tone and having impact in various ways that create the kind of impact on children's learning and development. So what you can see in looking at um, these nested eggs on the screen is that the early childhood administrator, whether that person's title is director or principal or executive director, um, through their leadership and management practices, are impacting the mediating conditions that then impact children's learning and development. So what that executive director, principal, director, manager that um, does impact directly is the organizational culture and climate, teaching practices, and family engagement. And it's those three areas that then have the impact that uh, on children's development and learning that we um, measure and have the outcomes of which is the reason why we do this really important work. So what does that actually mean? Um, I want to think about organizational culture and climate first and how it relates to the quality of the teaching practices that Rebecca has just um, so beautifully described in terms of uh, the ability to really look at practice and make improvements. So um, when we talk about organizational culture and climate, we're really talking about the kinds of um, uh, the uh, I almost like to, the best way to present it is, is almost like a weather 
the analogy, how when you walk into an early childhood program, let's say you're a coach or an educational coordinator that works in a district and you go into a particular classroom or program, you get a sense as soon as you walk over the threshold about whether or not children are engaged, whether teachers are engaged with children in a way that's really um, supportive. There's a buzz and a level of, of conversation that's going on that you know that some good things are happening in that classroom. That relates to the organizational um, culture and climate bigger than just what's occurring in the individual classroom and with the individual teachers in a classroom in regard to the children. And that's what I want to take a couple minutes to, to just delve into a little bit more. How does administrator impact organizational culture and climate. Well, Rebecca has already talked about the um, way in which the leader needs to create a culture of support um, and trust, but what does it mean when you're doing this at an organizational level, um, not just in terms of coaching relationships um, with teachers? And what it means is creating that organizational culture and climate that people really believe that the organization treats people fairly, respect is um, per pervades everything that goes on within the organization, that there is a spirit of innovation, that there is a certain amount of risk and innovation that is encouraged, uh, that there is an opportunity for professional growth individually and organizationally, um, that people's comfort and their physical space is really meeting their needs. So there is um, a whole range of what I would like to think of as the dimensions of the organizational climate that really impact what you as the coach or leader see when you walk into a classroom. And it's going to impact those teaching practices that you see at the classroom level. And so um, I think that it's really important that before we focus on what's happening in the classroom, we also are focusing on what's happening at this organizational level as well. Um, so one of the things that we think at the McCormick Center is so critically important is this concept of distributed leadership because the administrator cannot do it alone. If an organization is going to become an organization that's committed to ongoing quality improvement, um, essentially what we're looking for is an, a learning organization. We're learning that's going on at all levels and this requires that staff develop their skills, their leadership skills in um, many ways, teacher leaders, uh, other administrators in the program, that leadership doesn't belong only at the top, but leadership is what we, I would call an organizational asset. So next slide, please. So what do I mean by leadership as an organizational asset? And um, you have a handout that everybody should have that they could click on the link of the uh, a PDF um, of le the leadership skills inventory. So if people would cl click on that link. Yeah, I just chatted um, it out in the chat pane too. If you can't mm -hmm. click on it, you can always copy and paste that link into your browser and it will start a download of that PDF immediately. Okay, so thank you. So what this is coming from um, one of, my, uh, of the resources that we use at the McCormick Center that my colleagues here wrote called Inspiring Peak Performance, um, Confidence, Commitment, and Collaboration written by Paula Bloom, Ann Henschel, and Jill Bella. And this leadership skills inventory is one of the resources that's in this book. And what it is basically saying is that in high performing organizations, true learning organizations, the leadership skills are not held only by one or two people, but are widely distributed throughout the staff, regardless of role or title. And so, 
How do you know whether leadership skills are really available to the few or the many in the center? And so we developed this leadership skills inventory as a, a check, you know, kind of as a checklist of what are those leadership skills that we would like to see. Are they exhibited by just a few? Are they exhibited by many in the organization? And once you look as a leader, um, particularly if you are the administrator, the school administrator, the center director, Head Start manager, to think about whether or not leadership is really um, being developed at all levels. So some of the things that you would see on this inventory is the ability to listen attentively and respectfully, the ability to ask thoughtful questions that expand others' other understanding of important issues, understanding another person's point of view and unique perspective, the ability to facilitate a meeting that provides a good balance between getting the work done and encouraging people attending to be in participation mode, um, is the ability to make um, concise and persuasive arguments or a document that clearly communicates information to the audience. Are the leadership skills needed um, to synthesize important information from documents and reports, uh, the ability to keep informed about new trends in the field, stay on task with the project, provide feedback to others in a direct, respectful, and supportive manner, receive feedback without becoming defensive. Complete high priority tasks with the effective use of time. Organize space and materials to facilitate the efficient use of time. Show concern and empathy for others. Diffuse conflict by resolving complaints and grievances in an honest, open, professional manner. Intervene to stop gossip. Collect and analyze data to benchmark improvement efforts. So, um, these are just, I mean, there's more on this list, and I, you know, welcome you to use this leadership skills inventory to look at how leadership is being distributed through your organization and thinking of leadership as an organizational asset. But when leadership is distributed in this way, when leadership skills are intentionally developed by others, what happens then is that the organization becomes a professional learning community that allows for teachers to learn um, from coaches, from supervisors, to learn from each other. And so what I want to do um, is change, uh, change slides. And kind of shift directions a little bit to thinking about learning teams. So in a professional community of practice, um, I like to think of the leader's role or the administrator's role as creating an entire organization that's a learning community. But one, how do you, how do you actually go about doing that? One of the strategies, and the strategy is well developed in the Inspiring Peak Performance um, uh, book, which I referenced before, one of the key strategies is by creating learning teams. And so you can see that um, learning teams um, are, are defined as just, you know, in just simple language, they're defined as um, ongoing groups that meet regularly for the purpose of increasing their own learning and that of children. So um, as a leader, it may be extremely hard to balance uh, the demands of the job. Um, as Rebecca mentioned before, an administrator in particular wears lots of hats. But one of the ways in which to support staff members learning um, on the job is to not think about that needing to all be done in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the staff, the teaching staff members. And so in inspiring peak performance, my colleagues use this term uh, learning teams, and um, it's really not important what they're called, whether it's a community of practice or, you know, a learning community or peer-to-peer -peer technical assistance. But all of those terms are variations on the same theme. They all are used to describe practices that create 
the context and the place for collaboration and professional growth. So when learning teams are put together, they're designed to use learning standards, child assessments, and data to assist in the learning process through intentional reflection. So if we think that distributed leadership is a key component to creating um, uh, the organization culture and climate that supports learning organizations, one way it gets manifest is by really believing that your teachers have the ability to really lead and be in charge of their own learning. Creating space and opportunity for peer learning teams is one strategy that allows teachers to take control of um, responsibility for their own professional growth. Um, next slide. So um, professional development, we now know, um, is most effective when it's intentional and embedded in the day-to-day -day practice of teaching. Um, it's very difficult. I do a lot of training. We at, our, at the McCormick Center do a lot of intensive training on um, leadership development. And what we know is that when content is embedded at the closest level within the program, that is when it is the most impactful for changing behavior. So um, when I say there is a need for peer learning teams, or that's one really effective strategy to help um, create this context of a learning organization, what I mean by that is not just that a director makes a, a room and a bit of time available for people to get together because you know we've all seen when that just turns into a gripe session and that's not what this is about but it is about is creating embedded practices that really bring peers together to share their knowledge and to reflect together on ways to improve practice. Um, next slide. So in terms of the goal of a professional learning or peer learning team, the goal is not to just receive it. It's not like getting people together to hear someone come in and lecture them, but it's really about getting staff together to construct their knowledge, understand and apply it, and then think and analyze. Um, and so as you can see in looking over the goals, what we're really talking about is this active involvement in their own professional growth. Um, Margie Carter uh, has really offered these different um, goals in her work that she's developed with Deb Curtis around communities of practice. Um, this is the kind of engagement we want for our teachers, but when you think about the professional development that teachers often receive, how passive that learning often is, um, you can see that there's a disconnect between the goals that you see listed on this slide and what teachers um, and are, are, are most likely to engage in, in terms of professional development. So one of the things that strikes me as I was um, listening to Rebecca is the issue about if these are the real goals that we want for teachers learning, how do those goals align with other work in our field? And don't these goals look an awful lot like the goals we have for children? So if you think about it, we want children to construct their own knowledge, not just to be lectured at. We want children to learn to think and analyze, not just accumulate facts. And most importantly, we know children learn by doing, being active, not passive. So I think it's just interesting to think about how we know what young children need in order to really grow most and learn most effectively, and yet for some reason we lose some of that hands-on experiential learning um, when it comes to working with adults. So um, if you could change the slide, you'll see that um, I've had uh, us look again at that parallel process piece. Um, 
because again, what we want for children is the same as what we want for the adults. We want um, teachers to be able to build on relationships with each other. We want teachers to acknowledge their own and others' emotions. We want teachers to be able to analyze and reason through problem solving. It is indeed a parallel process. Um, next slide. So I know it's hard when we're not all together and we can really communicate about this more, but some of you might be thinking, well, gee, you know, I don't know if my staff are really able to come together in peer learning um, situations and really achieve those goals that we were just talking about. So one of the things that I would encourage you as um, the program leader is to think about assessing the readiness of your teaching staff. And here are, are just some um, ways in which to think about how, whether or not um, your teachers are ready to engage in the kind of active self-directed learning that um, you just saw on the previous slide. So do your teachers demonstrate an interest in continuous quality improvement? Are they friendly, supportive, trusting of each other? Do they have an understanding of the center's core values or the school's core values. Did the teachers exhibit a deep and act really genuine interest in children's learning? And most importantly for directors and administrators, are you as the leader willing to modify work schedules so teachers can meet together on a regular basis? So there's a certain amount of self-reflection as a leader that you need to be make. You have to think, do you value, do you trust, do you respect your teachers enough to be able to give them the opportunity for this kind of peer learning experience? And, you know, it may be that some of the work that needs to happen is to um, um, think about the scheduling, think about how you could make this happen, and then overcome some of the fears a leader might have that the time won't be well spent. And one of the ways in which to do that are we're going to get into now. Um, so the next slide, please. It's important to create ground rules for peer learning teams to make sure that the time really is focused on teaching and learning and not becoming just another opportunity for socializing or for griping. And so some of the ground rules have to do with promoting participation by all, making sure to ensure, <laughs> making sure to ensure equity, meaning that everyone's voice gets heard, um, that they're uh, aren't biases brought into this um, team, and that there is active, intentional trust building going on. And so think about what would those ground rules look like um, in order to make sure that uh, this time is well spent. You might ask yourself, what supports do you might need in your program in order for your staff to be really ready um, to, for this kind of a learning team. Um, next slide. So um, this is just showing you um, those three main area, areas that need to be um, attended to. And think about, well, in order to promote participation by all and ensure equity and build trust, it needs a facilitator, and that facilitator may not be you as the program leader. Uh, maybe that you participate as a leader within the peer learning community, or maybe you're not there at all. But the role of a facilitator is to really pay attention to people's um, participation, to make sure there's no air hogs, to ask probing questions, to literally act as a facilitator to support the group's thinking and learning. Um, next slide. Um, 
the la and this is actually my last slide. So for I started out by saying, what's the role of the leader? And whether or not the leader is an ed coordinator or a um, administrator of the whole program or a principal, I think that what I want to get across is that the person who is that leader its primary job is to be a bridge, is to connect to all of the others in the organization in helping to develop their leadership skills and assets in order to accomplish what we really want to see happen for the children and the families in the programs that we serve. So um, that kind of ends what I have to say, but I think we have um, time for questions. Um, and I'm going to see if uh, you know, open it up. I would see if for how you might think about are there any um, questions in the chat box? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and monitor the chat box if you guys want to go ahead and chat in anything, comments, or stuff you want to add to the presentation. Um, I've got one kind of specific question for you, Terry. Is okay. there is there a best practice in the number of people that should be in these learning teams, in communities of professional practice, what have you? Yes, I would say if you think about um, learning teams, I think that you really do need to keep the number small under 10. And so it could could be that you're, you're, it, this would not be this, the meeting of an entire staff or even all of the teachers unless it was a small program. It might be all the infant toddler teachers or it might be um, some mixture of teachers across the age spans in order to understand how um, the content of the curriculum and the, the learning activities um, work together. But I would say definitely, you know, more than three and, you know, up to about 10 would be the ideal size. Great. Thanks. Um, I guess this question could be for both of you. When you are assessing the readiness in your program, Terry, you mentioned that you need to think about how much time you can set aside as a leader. Um, and Rebecca, you, you mentioned that you should be reflecting on what you can build on. Uh, it, there has to be a balance, you know, like too much time, too little time. Some of it eats away from the other duties you have. Do you have any comments on uh, tips you can do for, you, you have for coming up with answers? Hmm. Oh, sure, Terry, I'll take a little bit of that okay. question. So what, what I would say, I, I, what I would say is time is a very personal piece, right? If you're over a full-time program or part-time program, what I would say about time is that it needs to be consistent, right? It can't be something that you come to one month and skip the next month and then go back to. So when I think about it, you know, just like, you, we all hate to be schedulers, but the more we schedule time right into our calendar and into our day, the better we are about making that a priority, right? We kind of Rapianta says, you know, that gets that what it gets measured gets done. I'd like to say that what that what gets scheduled gets done. And right. so what I would say is to think about yourself and is it something you know? Is it going to a, into classrooms on a daily basis? Is it having that meeting on a, a monthly basis or a weekly basis or a biweekly basis? Whatever works for your group in the amount of time, I think more important is that regularity, right? Making sure you have it scheduled, people know when it's going to come, it comes at a good time. I always think about scheduling things like if you're in a Head Start program and you have some of your, you know, 30 and 60 day requirements, making sure you don't have your teacher reflection and, you know, in culture building meeting the day before the, those assessments are due. So making sure people have the t time scheduled in and it's at the right time that, so they have space to think. Yeah, I would just, you know, echo what you're saying about the regularity. I mean, some of you may know me from being um, author of the program administration scale, and one of the leadership constructs throughout the program administration scale, which measures leadership and management practices, is 
building up to having systems in place that really support good practice happening consistently. And so the idea of things being regular is a key concept to something being systematic. It needs to be predictable. Everybody knows what happens at that particular time. It's transparent. And then it becomes um, an embedded practice or an organizational condition that's going to support effective teaching and learning. In this case, whether it's um, the observations and support that's offered in coaching conversations or whether it is peer learning teams, having them regularly set um, in advance so that that kind of work is happening at a system level is really, really key. Um, I would also like to just kind of reiterate that there is no one size fits all. Organizational context is a critical piece of this analysis. A very small program is going to be function very differently than a large program. So that in a very small program, you may have a leader who's acting as a teacher part of the day and as the administrative leader another part of the day. That person's going to have less time available, but perhaps actually has lots of hands-on, on-the-ground experience with the children and with families because half of the day they may be a teacher. On the other hand, a very large organization is likely to have multiple leader roles where there may be an ed coordinator or a, you know, an instructional leader in addition to the administrative leader. And in that case, you're going to be able to structure um, coaching conversations, schedule time observing and, and modeling in the classroom, and scheduling time for um, facilitating peer learning teams in a way that the small sized organization cannot do. So it's not about there being one perfect way, but about being able to understand the organizational context and figuring out what can be scheduled regularly that you can honestly commit to and follow through on.